Hi, you Road to Growth listeners. Today I have uh, Sean Campbell. Uh, he is a conference speaker and author, consultant, uh, wears a lot of different hats. Thank you, Sean, for being here. Hey, no problem. Happy to be on, especially with a fellow baseball fan. I can see all the Padres gear in the background. So, oh, huge Padre fan. My my new idea is to wear actually a Padres hat every single episode. So if you're if you're watching us live on YouTube, Google Play, Stitcher, I mean, on any of those platforms, um, you'll see basically a lot of Padres stuff here. If you listen to us, you just have to imagine. Go Padres. Go Padres. Go Padres. No, that's right. yeah. I actually just I actually just drove up to the Mariners uh, final game with my son yesterday. I had a great time with my son, but they ended up if people followed him, they kind of were a little Cinderella the back half of this year and kind of almost made it. And we went to the game live and then they lost and then Washington didn't beat Boston and the Yankees ended up pulling it out over Baltimore in the very end. But it was kind of cool because it was all happening live. You know, at right right at noon, all of those games were at the same time because it was the last day of the season. So it was cool. It's a good crowd and always good to be there for the last game of the season. Anyway, I've done that a few times. So, yeah, it's uh, there could have been a lot more chaos in the National League and the uh, American League. But in the end, it was uh, pretty straightforward, I think, with the teams that made it in. No one game playoff. Yeah, yeah. I was kind of looking forward to some like try or quad level tie or something kind of exotic. But it didn't. Yeah, it didn't really quite play out that way. But it was it was fun while it lasted. It's been a long time since the Mariners made game 162 count. So this has been, it was fun to watch. It's funny, funny, quick note on that. We can talk about what we're talking about. But my son's sitting next to me at the game and I grew up a Cubs fan, right? And he's staring at the banners in T-Mobile Park that are like the last time they won the division championship was like 2001 when they had 116 wins and then cratered, which was horrible. But it was the Ichiro era, so that was at least fun. And so, but he looks at me and he goes, these guys are like my Cubs, dad. They haven't won the whole time I've been alive because he's 18. And I was like, I said, yeah, I guess that's true. It's kind of sad. Like, you know, I mean, you know, my grandfather never saw the Cubs win. My dad only saw him win when he had like three years left, you know, and I got to see him when I was like, you know, late 40s. So like, you know, it's it, it hasn't gone that long for him, but I understood his pain a bit. So oh, I, I feel the pain. We've I mean, I have a in the background, a 98 champion, and that wasn't even the World Series because we never won the World Series. So that was just getting there. So, hey, it's uh, we all have hopes and aspirations, but it's it all goes down to good coaching, just like the Potters looking for probably going to look for a new manager. You've been doing so much <laughs> coaching uh, and teaching throughout your life. And now you, you're you're consultant, but you're also an author, um, speaker. So you're trying to provide as much information it seems like out there correct yeah yeah i mean basically i've always um i think of entrepreneurship and owning a business is a lot like teaching in a lot of ways it's not identical of course but you know i was originally going to be a college professor and then i met a um a beautiful girl who i didn't want to go starve with so i decided i wasn't going to be a college professor although she she always says she would have followed me to waterloo iowa which is where the phd program was going to be and um Ended up going out and becoming an independent technical trainer and then did that for a while, then founded my first business and sold that and founded my second business and uh, have had that for about 15 years now. But no, there's a lot of um, coaching and education and training. And um, and I, th I think there, there's also, and, and I don't know if this is um, heretical to say, I guess, but there, there's also, I think... Um, coaching coaching's become a little bit of a four letter word. And I think some of that is because of the way it's been kind of marketed, you know, it's like, you know, I'm a health coach and I'm in this kind of coach and I'm this kind of coach and I'm this kind of coach. I mean, uh, this really may have nothing or maybe a lot to do with what you want to talk about, but I feel like there's, um, there's a gap sometimes that's not fulfilled. Right. I mean, to be a very good coach, you have to know a lot more than the person you're coaching. And if all you know is to not eat, and someone else doesn't know how to not eat. I don't know if that's really like a coach, right? So I feel like there has to be a gap of, of real knowledge and context to be helpful. And, um, you know, and that's, that's just a change I've noticed over the last 20 years, right? I mean, the way the word coach is used is very different than it was before. And again, that's not to say these people aren't helping people. I don't want to be insensitive to what these people are going through, the help they need. But I think, you know, if you really want to teach and help people, you have to have something meaningful to say more so than just kind of a, you know, a box of goods, some big 
you know, Corp gave you that you're selling out to everybody is a, you know, again, not to knock health coaches, but like, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, no, overall, I've always been really passionate about education and, and, and anything related to that on the entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. I mean, I think the idea of coach and consultant, I mean, there's so many different words that are used in kind of that, um, sector now and you have so many different people taking on that title and it's really what kind of knowledge base they have on i think for the most part people that that have had coaches that i've had on the podcast or at least in the field most people that i i've had in the field at least coaching they have had their own coaches and they go look at someone that's where you want to be right so they they have the the knowledge they have the understanding of of where you want to be and so you can follow their roadmap to get there. That's kind of how they've kind of mostly told me about it. Do you feel that the person has to have actually been there or at least have the knowledge how to get there? What's your take? Um, it's a good question. I, I think honestly, to a large extent, they have to have been there. Um, okay. I, I think because it's funny, I, I had a guy today just say a great line just this morning. I mean, clients don't always say great lines, but like they did this morning. I was talking to a guy and uh, he was trying to describe the problem they wanted us to help him with. And he said, um, I like to think in terms of arrival. It's a great line. You know, like I just like to think in terms of getting to the end first and then working back. And I think the problem is if, if you've never been there, if you, you know, if you go to some guy to help you understand how to run a professional services firm, that's 30 people, but all he's ever had, or she's ever had is two people. And they've read a lot of books. I think there's just something that that's lacking. I mean, I, I'm all for academic knowledge. Don't get me wrong. Like I, one of the big things I do around our company is we, we literally read books. I mean, as a company, and then share that. I mean, that's really odd these days. Like nobody seems to want to do that anymore. But like, you know, I'll have team meetings where I'm like, okay, next two weeks, we're going to read this book and then we're going to go talk about it. And I have people in the company be like, this is really cool. I don't have anybody spend this much time on this kind of stuff. And, um, but part of that's because we're a consulting firm. We're, we do market research on the industry. We provide marketing services to tech. We're hired because we're smart or we're not. So if we don't spend time educating ourselves, I, I mean, who should hire us? So, but all that to say, like, you know, and I guess this ties in even to our current business is that we turn down a lot of work that doesn't fit lanes that we don't have context in that whole point of, I think, in terms of arrival, if I don't know the space that you want me to help advise you with, like, I haven't been there for a while. Um, I don't really know. I don't really know how I can help you. Right. I mean, in a way that really matters. I mean, um, so, so I don't know. I don't know. I, I would tend to think you have to have been there more than you just kind of know a, a path to get there. Does that happen like frequently where someone comes with you with a, an idea of where they want to be and uh, you guys haven't been there and refer them out to someone else or just say, we don't feel comfortable in taking it down that road? Well, it's interesting because a lot of being a market research firm um, it is precisely those kinds of questions, right? So if you're a B2B technology company, which is who we feel we can advise, because um, Scott, my co-owner and I, we both plug networks together, wrote code, installed databases, maintained databases. We've done all the technical group over our years. We wrote technical books, we were certified on various technologies, and then we started our firm. So we understand tech at a level that most market research firms don't. We were actual practitioners. And so, you know, when we're talking to a market research, I mean, a technology company, and they say, I'd like to get here, help design the research that can help me get there. Well, we really understand those audiences and those people that they're going to go after. So I don't, I, again, I don't, I don't really know a way that you can help people meaningfully if you haven't already arrived there, if you haven't been in the space. I mean, to be sure, every once in a while, and I call these kind of mousetrap consultants, right? You can have somebody who's really developed like a process or a framework that is kind of so amazingly cool and useful that you truly can apply it universally. But what I would say about those things is a lot of times they only have a fairly limited shelf life because part of the reason they work is that they're new, right? That model, that way of shoving the world through that cheese grater and making it come out like something you want to eat at the other end, right? That, that model 
tends to lose its sharpness after it's been out there for a while and people have reacted to it and, and kind of modeled against it. So it's not to say you can't have a consulting organization or a coach or a trainer or whatever who has this model and they're applying it to accounts of all different types. But I, I think realistically, you have to look at that consultant and wonder how long have they been doing it. If they've been applying that model for like 20 years, it might not be that sharp anymore. At least that's my opinion. Well, let's, let's go back into, into your story. So you talked about it, how uh, you were working for, you said for a university, right? Well, yeah. I mean, the base, so the basic story goes like this to be, so I was go, master's degree was a teacher there at the time, paying my way through my master's degree, wanted to go get a PhD, was on the track, wanted to be a college professor, decided not to starve, um, decided to go off and be a technical trainer. So then I got hired by this outfit, um, had a job, had another job, had one more job, and then um, decided I was going to go branch off and go be an independent trainer and started a company with two other guys to co-brand. And so that led to Three Leaf Solutions. So that's how that played out. Okay. So jumping from job to job to job to job, how long were you at each job while you're jumping around? Oh, not that long. I mean, this, this was in the beginning of, I mean, I left my master's degree. I had one job that um, New Horizons, which uh, unfortunately had such horrible turnover that I was the last employee left standing out of 30 instructors in six months. So wow. that was a reasonable job to get out of, uh, let's just say. And then, um, I had another job, which is a really good one, worked at it for a good long while that was actually doing like technical apps and training. And then I went to a different job in downtown Chicago at the time, cause now I live in Portland, Oregon, but I lived in Chicago when I grew up. And, um, that's where I met my wife too. And um, basically from that job, ended up uh, moving to Portland and ended up meeting the two guys that um, I ended up forming the first business with. And so it was, you know, it was a pretty typical, like kind of out of college kid kind of career progression. You know, you have a couple jobs to figure out what you want to do. And then for me, at least, I realized I just really wanted to go own my own business and be independent. And, and that was kind of the route I took. And that was oh, when I was 29 back then. So it's, I yeah. been this is like 21 years later at this point. Well, and, and the, the question, the question I get to is in, in a situation like this, is there anything that one of those companies could have done at that time to keep you there even to this day? You know, it's interesting. Um, the last outfit in Chicago, maybe, I mean, I had a boss there that was great. Um, precisely because he treated us a bit like entrepreneurs and residents a bit that that phrase wasn't really utilized back then. I mean, this is, this is 20 plus years ago. So, but, um, but the, the longer answer, or well, I guess the shorter answer, no, uh, I think I was probably always wired to go work for myself. I mean, I, there were many reasons for that we could talk about or things that if I look back, I think, I think I knew why I was and why, why it wouldn't be as good for me to work for somebody else, at least, at least for that stage of my career. Um, but yeah, no, I don't think there's probably anything that could have done in, in realistic terms. Well, you, I guess you set me up for the, the next one. Then, then why you said, uh, you can think of some reasons why I wasn't. Probably yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think, I think one reason is, um, I don't, I don't need a lot of structure to work. Meaning, um, you know, some people like, and, and they know themselves and it's great. Like they're, they're like, look, if, if, you know, if I'm not in another organization, I'm just going to fold the laundry for eight hours and watch the latest thing on Netflix. Right. I'm not wired that way. And part of the reason I'm not wired that way to tie it back to what we talked about before is, um, I am pathologically incapable. I've realized of learning something and not wanting to teach somebody else it. Just if there's anything they should write on my tombstone is like everything he learned, he wanted to teach. I, it's and it's not like an ego thing. It's not like oh, I know more than you, so I I got to go tell you that. It, it's more like a service thing for me. I'm just wired that way, like deep down in my genetic bones, right? It's like I just if I learn something, whatever it is. I feel like, hey, let's share this. Let's learn this. Let's go do this together, right? It's kind of it's kind of the way I am. And it's even unlike volunteer activities, like whether I'm the baseball coach or, you know, whatever. But um, so 
to me, I stay motivated by that constant inflow of new things to learn as a business owner, right? Now, that doesn't mean it isn't without its scary moments or it's, you know, not so happy moments or, you know, months where you wish things were different. I mean, that's just life. But yeah, so the one thing is I just don't need a lot of structure to go work in the morning. And the second thing is um, I'm not really frightened by... I guess the, the, the gray challenges of owning a business, like, like, yes, there's key, things that keep me up at night, but generally speaking, whatever is scaring me about a business challenge is overwhelmed by kind of the, I don't know if I'd call it joy, but like the, the, the juice you get from figuring out how to solve that problem. Right. You know, so I don't really get bored easily with it either. And then the other thing is I, I'm not, I never got into it. And I think this is super important. I never got into it to be rich. Now, I'm not saying most small service owners ever get rich, but there is definitely this weird thing that happens. I've seen it over and over and over again over the years. Somebody leaves corporate America and they say, I'm going to go work for myself. And they do this crazy weird math where it's like, I'm going to work a certain number of hours. I'm going to bill out at Y and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And all of a sudden I'm going to make like twice as much as I used to say, used to make. And partly to keep it real with people, when they talk to me, I'll usually say something like this. I say, could you mind if we talk about that for a minute? <laughs> They'll be like, sure. And I'll say, okay, so let's do this. So you want to work so many hours and you want to get paid this. That's great. I said, um, so uh, when are you going to take a vacation? And they're like, okay, I'll take that off. And I say, so when are you going to, um, sell. And they're like, well, I have some clients. I'm like, yeah, but they're going to go away. So when are you going to sell? And so then they, they subtract X amount of time for that. And then I say, so when are you going to market? And they subtract X amount of time for that. I said, when are you going to do your books? I'm going to hire that out. Well, you can't just hire it out. You got to go oversee it. Right. So you got to make sure things go well. And so finally we get down and I'm like, okay, so that hundred percent of hours, you're down to something like 42% now. So if you could still make money. And then I said, do you know what the tax man does to self-employed individuals? <laughs> You know what they do? Like, because if you actually start making it, well, be ready to pay like 40% in taxes. Now, this is not a political statement. This is just a math statement. You know, like at some point when you go on your own, you're paying all these taxes that somebody else was paying. And I said, you know, when you want a new laptop, who's going to buy that? And I don't do it to demoralize these people. I do it to say like, go into this for some reason other then you're somehow going to make twice the bank you did where you were working because it's almost guaranteed that you're going to make less in the beginning. Almost guaranteed. Cause when you finally get done with all this math, but there's a, there's an author and this ties in to me, like it, it's not about wealth that way. There's an author, a guy named Alan Weiss that I love reading. Um, sometimes he's, occasionally he's a little too full of his own hat. If you get what I'm getting at, but like he, he writes really good stuff overall. And he has this thing. He says, the only true wealth is discretionary time, which sounds really like, wait a minute, that sounds like kings and queens. And it sounds it sounds weird. But if you understood the guy and the way he uses it, it actually makes a lot of sense. At the end of the day, right? Do you really care that you made much more money just for the sake of money or you build so many more hours for the sake? Of no, of course you don't. You cared because it let you do something. And for a lot of people, that's discretionary time. Now, how they use that discretionary time, well, that's a different thing. That's about you, the person. You know, I'm not a guy that's going to go build castles and buy huge boats and airplanes and whatever. For me, that's going to be spending time with my family or volunteering at the church or, or volunteering to teach, right, you know, in some social context. So, again, I think the other reason it worked for me and I survived is that, um, yeah, I, it's been nice to have a good career progression and salary progression over 21 years. But I never got into it to just make a quick buck. So when things got lean or I had to make some tough decisions financially or something had to happen, it wasn't like the end of the world for me because that wasn't what I was operating under. It wasn't the fuel that was driving it. So I don't know. Those things all led to it. I was. I think I just have always had enough of a right mindset about it um, compared to people to sum up who either like they got in it to too much for the money, they can't structure or organize self, Um and frankly, they're maybe just not wired to deal with the just incredibly range of problems owning a business will present you, even when it's running well. You have to be willing to look at that as like an opportunity to be creative 
and not just constantly feel frustrated by it. Well, going back to your, I mean, your original idea of kind of what drove you or what drives you, I guess, to, to start your own business is the idea of teaching, learning something right. um, and giving back, right? How do you know, and it, is there a, a feeling you get, uh, some kind of barometer that you, you kind of weigh off of, that you know the information well enough that you're okay to teach it? That's a great question. Um, I, I think, I think to some extent, you have to be willing to test your knowledge is really the only answer I could give you to that. I mean, it's the only legitimate answer, right? I mean, you have to go to the people that you want to teach, that you want to educate, and you have to be open, truly open to feedback. Hey, you don't have enough of a gap yet. You haven't really learned enough. And, and, and part of the reason I think that's incredibly legitimate is it's also true in the market research work we do. And this isn't a tie back to talk about our services. It just got me thinking that like legitimately there's a lot of connective tissue here. Like um, when you do market research, you have to do enough of it to essentially obtain enough significant data and enough kind of overall, you know, statistical significance of a sort to determine that you really know something about the market. So you can't just go talk to two people. You might have to talk to 20 people, right? You can't just survey five people. You might have to survey 500 people. And the reason you do that is you don't know if you've created enough of a gap. And if you also don't know if you've seen all the perspectives that you need to, so that you can kind of figure it out. So I think the short answer is if somebody's asking themselves that question, like, can I go off and do this? Ask people who tell you the truth. Because the other thing is you can't necessarily always go to just friends and family, right? Because they're also in your corner, right? They want you to see your dreams, right? So you got to go to somebody who can actually be like, you know, you kind of need another year or two of seasoning before you go do that, right? I don't think you really got it yet. Or yeah, it sounds like a great book idea, but I read the first chapter and it honestly says the same thing I read in seven other business books. That might be tough love, but it's probably better you hear that now before you go off and become you know, an entrepreneur. It doesn't mean it ends the dream. It's just, it's maybe delayed a little bit. So well, I, I guess, it's, I mean, it, it takes to the next question, right? Is that how do you know that you have the right people around you, that they're actually going to be honest about what they truly feel and not just try to pull you down? I think you have to do something that very few people do when they launch almost any venture is you have to actually do the legwork to go talk to people who will buy from you. Mm. I mean, you have to, I mean, and it's not that hard. I mean, it's really not that hard. I mean, we've seen it over and over and over again, and this can be self done again. I'm not talking about like hiring us. I mean, if you're, if you're small and starting out, you're not a good fit for us anyway. I mean, we tend to work with, you know, upper size startups, mid markets and enterprise. So if you're like three people in a, you know, three people and three laptops, you're probably not coming to us for research anyway. So like, um, but you can go to almost any market and ask them, hey, I would like to be a supplier of X to your market. Is my value proposition strong enough? Do I know enough laid out in this way to really help you? And what happens is people really shy away from that. I think there's a few different reasons. One, they're afraid of like burning a customer that maybe will become a customer by looking weak or unempowered or un, uh, you know not as knowledgeable. And I'm kind of like, well, if your market was only those three customers, you better not get started anyway, regardless, right? I mean, you better have more customers than that. So burning a few just to show that you lack a little knowledge in the beginning, I think is well worth it. Um, and then the other thing is like, some people just have a hard time with the outreach. I mean, one of my favorite stories that, because I taught an MBA program for a while and I taught industry analysis and competitive intelligence. And so some of the students uh, would come in and we had this exercise where I would say, OK, you got this business plan, you know, typical MBA kind of thing, like develop a business plan for X and figure out if it'll work. And so uh, I said, well, you got to figure out if it will work. And what I would do with my students is I say, you got to go talk to a bunch of potential potential customers. And a lot of them would shy away from it. They'd go into the library. They'd go read a bunch of statistics and say, no, I really mean you got to go talk to them. I had this one group of kids that were convinced they wanted to sell this like, I don't even remember what it was anymore, but it was some something that would help men when it came to childcare with babies. Can't really remember what it was. It was this thing. Uh, and so, but they wanted to sell it in like traditional retail outlets, like a Nordstrom's, right? 
And so they were like, we, you know, but we haven't talked to anybody, you know, but we think it'll be successful. And I says, well, why haven't you talked to anybody? And they're like, well, we don't think anybody will talk to us. So I said, come over to my office. So this is 8 30 at night. And I called the local Nordstrom's and I called the baby department and I talked to the main person that was like in charge of all the sales for like that department. And I said, Hey, there's some kids here who want to talk to you and say kids, but you know, they want to talk to you about this thing that they'd like to offer to the market. You know, we're going to be a little vague about it because it's kind of a cool idea there's, but we just want to see like, you know, does this thing fit some job to be done? Something you think customers would buy because you work in this department. Um, they got all kinds of info. You know, but they were convinced that there was nobody to go talk to. So sometimes it's also, um, I, I think just a, I don't know, it, it's hard to go talk to people sometimes, you know, it's easier to go talk to your friends and your family and your uncle and your brother and your sister for the thousandth time. Um, and I guess this is the corollary of why you find so many people who, um, you know, they write their business plan over and over and over again, but they never launch their business. Well, I think something that a lot of people forget is that most people want to feel important, right? So by you calling that person and saying, hey, we're looking for an expert and you right. you are an expert, right? Can you give us a little feedback? Whatever, you, how you ever going to sell it? They go, oh, well, I'm, yeah, I'm an expert. Okay, fantastic. Well, yeah, right, right. I've said for years, I've said for years, like when people ask me, like, like my in-laws, I love my in-laws. I actually have great in-laws. I really genuinely do. But my in-laws, like, uh, you know, I remember in a very like, how are you going to support our daughter kind of statement, right? When we started out the market research, there was this statement kind of like when we started that business, like, well, why do people talk to you? And I jokingly have said for years, like if you tell, and, and because it's a legitimate thing in our case, we're reaching out to business audiences and we're saying, we'd like to ask your opinion about X. To your point, if you said to anyone on the planet, I think you're smart about X. Can you tell me about it for a half an hour? There's basically zero people that, don't accept that invitation. Basically zero. I mean, um, unless they don't know the information. Well, well, right. And then you don't want them anyway, right? So, yeah, exactly. then, then, it's, then it's an equal game, right? Then you're done. Yeah. So, but no, I mean, as long, and again, as long as you're asking a legitimate question of the right person that shows depth, seriously, almost anybody will do it. I mean, not tomorrow maybe, hmm. but like they will do it at some point in time. Was there ever a moment in building your second company. Well, actually, why did you transition from the first company that you built to the second company? What happened there? We, there... we sold the first company and okay. then and then moved into the second company. Okay. Was there ever a time when you're building up the second company that you had ideas of, of going back to corporate world and getting that steady paycheck, anything like that? Um, you know, it's funny. I was going to give you a hard no, but that's probably not really accurate. I mean, there was there was definitely a point in between there where um, it was for about maybe six months where I I really tried to figure out how I could market myself as kind of like, OK, I'm no longer this 29 year old kid. I'm now some 35 ish year old kid who's basically owned a business, done the story arc, what kind of job do I want? And I found out pretty quickly through some experiences that like, I probably wasn't gonna be happy, right? I mean, I still had access to a good client base. I could still build another business. Um, and my, and to be honest, I think my business partner now, who was one of the two business partners I had back then too, he still felt, I think he felt much the same way. I shouldn't put words in his mouth, but like, um, but he, I think he also felt like, well, hey, this is, this story isn't really written yet. It's not all the way done, right? I think we can just go build a second business. And that, and that's what led to the founding of Cascade Insights. So yeah, I think there was some, there was some hesitancy there. I mean, there's definitely like, do I want to start it all over again with a, you know, new value proposition and maybe a slightly new market, um, but I'm so glad I did. I, I don't I don't regret the decision one bit, not not at all. But there was definitely a little bit of hesitancy back then, I'm sure. And at that time, when you were starting the second company, you because you were married at that time, or correct, correct, okay. yeah. So yeah, Any children absolutely. at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was part of the hesitancy, right? Yeah. I was like, how can I build this thing in a way that like doesn't eat me up? But I think one of the biggest things that I got the benefit of, um, it's a little bit of personal history too. I I haven't I haven't. <laughs> I, I joke sometimes the 
you know, the, the former of this could, could put me on an Oprah episode one day uh, when they do the like, you know, people who've had this background and they stick them all in the show. You know, I had the weird uh, personal history of watching my parents get divorced when I was this. I'll tie this into work in a minute, but get divorced when I was in fifth grade, get remarried to each other again. I was the ring bearer in the ceremony at fifth grade. And then they divorced again when I was in college and got married to other people again. And then, you know, and so I've watched an interesting thing. Most people don't watch their parents get divorced and get remarried and get divorced again. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, I, and why I bring it up is, is, and it ties into the business is I feel somewhat blessed in a weird way that I went through both things because um, divorces, as everybody knows, is hard on the family and the kids and everybody gets strong opinions about who was right and who was wrong. Well, I got to tell you, when your parents get married and divorced, and then they get married again and then they get divorced again. The second time, the only thing you can really have is a fair amount of grace because you're kind of like, well, what am I going to do? Be upset all over again? That seems kind of silly, right? I mean, I'm going to I'm going to love both of you. You're obviously got flaws, just like I've got flaws. And I've got some perspective here that I'm going to go through. And the same thing happened to me with the second business. Um, I was able to walk into it. And and for me, the biggest difference that's always been with this business is my identity is not in the business. Uh, my identity was in the business, the first business. It doesn't mean I don't care. It doesn't mean I don't want it to succeed. It doesn't mean I don't care about the people here. But truly, at some deep level, if it wasn't here, I would be okay. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs have a very, very hard time. If you ask them that question, if you said, if this thing wasn't here, would you really mentally be okay? Or would you need like a year off on an island somewhere? And some of them, if they're being honest with themselves, they would need a year off on an island. And I, and I got to a place the second time around, a little bit like, again, watching your parents go through the loop twice, right? Is that, okay, the, I, I get the chance to have some perspective on this. And the other thing for me was absolutely a faith thing. My faith grew over those two decades. And that, that was a lot of where that identity went. You know, that's where I hold it now. But, but I... If it hadn't shifted off the business, that would have made owning this business that much harder. And it made it easier to make tough decisions about like, OK, we're not going to grow right now because I'm going to go spend time with my kids and I'm not going to get on the airplane for that gig because I don't want to miss a baseball game. You know, again, to go back to Alan Weiss's thing, the only real true wealth is discretionary time anyway. Do you do you think that that kid that just got out of school could have built his own business or did you think you had to go through the trials, tribulations of working for different companies, switching back and forth to get the full understanding of, of how to grow your business, how to build your business and get to where you are? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, we see it all the time. I mean, even when we hire people um, and I know, I know employees will listen to this. So I, I, I want to say this statement. I know this statement isn't universally applied and I'm talking to the people who like, I've personally had a role in hiring, you know, more on quote unquote, my side of the business. Cause Scott is an equal co-owner. But if I talk about my side of the business that I work on more daily, um, I have noticed that, it, you know, it's like the book grit that came out, right. And made the waves for a while about like, you have to have something in your life that creates a little bit of challenge to really make you grow. And we all know that, but, in business, sometimes we skip over that. And I, I found that like, inevitably, when I look deep into kind of the, the people we have, there's always some real challenge they went through. It, it might not have been in their own making. It might have been just a, a journey they had to make, you know, um, but it makes them stronger. And I, I, I to your question, I guess, I, I think if you just roll out of college and try to be an entrepreneur, I mean, you might make it work. But, you know, let's look at people like Zuckerberg. These are not the best human beings in the planet. You know what I mean? I think there's a bit of, I, I think you have to, you have to be humbled a little bit. You have to put the wheels through a little grit after a while. You have to kind of struggle a little bit. And then it'll force you to be a little more humble and respectful when, when you're kind of, you know, I don't know if the word made it is right, but you basically reach some kind of plateau that you're comfortable with. Um, yeah, I, I no, I don't think I would. I don't think it would have been nearly as successful. Um, I, I'd go so far as to say, if I did it straight out of college, it probably would have failed. Honestly, 
I, I needed the stuff in between there. I definitely did. If and I'll finish off with this. If, if anyone's listening right now and they want to reach out about uh, your services, what's the, the best way of, of finding your company, finding you, finding? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, well, there's two things I always offer. Like one, if you're an entrepreneur and you just want to talk to somebody who's you think might be like minded or you've got questions about how to market or you know, that kind of stuff, you can always reach out to me as like an individual connection. And that's just Sean at CascadeInsights.com. Um, if you want to work it with my company for services, that's a little different. If you're a B2B technology company of some form, you know, cloud or hardware or on-premise solutions, um, we're more than happy to work with you for market research and marketing needs. And you can find out all about that at CascadeInsights.com. Well, thank you, Sean, for, for being on the podcast. Thank you for, for, for being honest, being transparent, and, and thank you for making people understand that it's okay to fail um, because it'll allow you to kind of get forward and, and move forward. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on. Everyone, please subscribe, please share, and uh, follow Sean. Thanks, guys.